Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus. Somebody sit there with me. In the name of Jesus. We come this day, Lord, to declare without a doubt, Lord, you have already been good to us. You've heard our prayers. You've answered our prayers. You've watched over us. You cared for us. You provided for us. Even when we messed up, Lord, you were right there to get us back on track. And we say, thank you, Lord. And we come here today, Lord, with expectation, asking you, oh Lord, to move in a mighty way in this place today. And then, Lord, move in a mighty way in our lives today. That we may, Lord, experience the fullness of all that you have approved and authorized for our lives. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for gathering this group of people here today. A group of believers, some from this church and some from other churches. We thank you, Lord, for those who are here that are saved. But we thank you, Lord, for those that may not be saved today. Asking God that you prep them right now, Lord, for a new life in Jesus Christ. Let this be the last day that they are spectators to your power. Let them, after this day, be participators, Lord, in what you are doing in their lives. We pray, God, right now that you do spiritual surgery all over this building. Prepare each of us, Lord, not only to hear your word, but prepare us to receive your word this day. That we will know what your good and perfect will is for our lives. And then that when we leave this place, we will leave out in the victory that is already ours in Jesus Christ. And God, in doing so, we pray, God, you enter the preacher out right now, Lord. Fill him up, Holy Spirit, that your word may go forth this day with power and clarity. In Jesus' name. Somebody said with me in Jesus' name. Y'all know the name, don't you? The name that is above every name. In Jesus' name. The only name by which man may be saved. In Jesus' name. Him who was dead but now lives and lives forevermore. In Jesus' name. We say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And amen. Let's give God one more strong praise if you know God is good today. Oh, put your hands together. Lift up your voice and just say hallelujah. Amen. Oh, mighty God, we serve. If you're on your feet, grab your Bibles right quick. I'm not going to hold you on your feet very long, just for a second or two. If you got your Bibles, join me. If you got your phones or your iPads. MacBooks, whatever you're carrying, whatever you're carrying today. Laptops, all those devices. If you have loaded the Bible on there, turn with me to the book of 1 Kings. I want to take just a moment to welcome all of our guests today to let you know that we're glad you're here, to let you know that you're not here by accident. We may have scheduled a family and friends today, but we know the Lord meant for us to be together today. Amen. 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 I want to thank those who've traveled from out of town. I know we have a contingent of folks from South Carolina here. Welcome to the South Carolinians. Thank you. Let's give God praise for those who've traveled here today. Let's give God praise for them. And for those who may have traveled from a closer place, we welcome you today. God, St. Peter, let's give God praise for all of our guests today. All of our guests. We welcome you. I guess if you have not noticed by now, you can make yourself at home at St. Peter Baptist Church. If you had noticed it, then I want you to be clearly aware of the reality that you can just be who the Lord called you to be in this place. In the book of 1 Kings chapter 17, chapter 17, I want to commend all the St. Peter family for inviting your family and friends today. We have something special we're going to do right after the service, right after the sermon, rather. Right? Say amen when you're in chapter 17. Amen. Say it again if you're there. Amen. All right, we're going to read it several verses, but do not be frightened. We're not going to go as long as it sounds. Chapter 17, I'm going to begin reading at the first verse. And the Bible says that Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it came, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. 
So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, if that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and they brought bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Verse 8 says, And the word of the Lord came unto him and said, Go up now and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he got up and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel, that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring to thee me, me I pray thee, a morsel of bread. And she said, Look here, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Fear not. Go and do as thou hast said. But before you do that, make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me. And after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not fail, nor the cruise of oil, until the day that the Lord sent his rain upon the earth. And she would indeed all according to the word of, the Lord, word of Elijah. And she said, and she and her house, they ate many days. And verse 16 says, The battle of meal did not waste, neither did the cruise of all fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. If you would just grab your neighbor by the hand, and I'm not going to ask you to do that for about one or two more times a day. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, neighbor will you trust the Lord? Trust the Lord? Problems, Problems become provision, provision. and pressed pressed. leads you to plenty. Amen. 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 Man. Over the last couple of weeks, for those who may not have been here, we have been in this place where we are evaluating and looking and living in a place where we recognize that the Christian walk is not a haphazard or a random situation, but it instead is a walk that is ordained by God. And in light of the reality of our lives being ordained by God, we come to a point where we recognize that what we go through in life is not just what we go through. Uh, it's designed by God to do something for us and in us and even through us. In other words, the situations in life that we go through are not just random things that seem like they're happening. It's something that has been allowed or something that God has in fact uh, uh, approved or authorized and even many times promoted in our lives to get us from where we are to where he wants us to be. Uh, God never called his people to stay in one place. Even when he called the children of Israel to go and move them from the bondage of Egypt to the promised land, when they got to the promised land, they were not to stop there, but they would continue to move forward, even in the promised land, to accomplish all that God had ordained for them. And, and today, many of us, and I've got to be honest and be pastoral for a moment, many of us have not gone as far as God has called us to go uh, because we have complained at the sign of any trouble in our lives. Uh, many of us have only gone part of the way that God has called us to go because we'd rather be content and settled in a place that makes us feel good even if it ain't really good for us. And so if we look at the book of 1 Kings today, what we began to recognize is in this chapter 17 and wrapped right between chapter 16 in 1 Kings and in the 13th chapter of 2 Kings, we see a people who have gone astray but God in his providence and his love continues to work with them to bring them back unto himself. Let me see if I put this in contemporary terms. God loves us so much that he won't just let us walk away. And he'll do some stuff to bring us back to him. And I believe many of us in our lives, to be honest, if we assess our lives, are honestly, we recognize that there was some stuff that we did that we should not have done, but God, out of his love, still loved us enough to bring us back to him. I wish I had somebody been through something. Maybe I'm the only one been there. Maybe I'm the only one that's been there. That did you have walked away from God, but God walked you back to him through situation and circumstance. In chapter 17, uh, we see it. And it all really effectively understand our text today. We got to look at chapter 16 briefly. Chapter 16 gives us uh, understanding the people of Israel after the nation had been divided because of their inability to work together. The nation was divided. There were two sets of kings. Some, one set in Israel, another set in Judah. And these kings, uh, some followed God and some did not follow God. And unfortunately, the people did not have the mindset to follow God themselves. They followed the king in order to, to determine which way they would go. Chapter 16. 
kings began to be more and more honorary, more and more evil, and more and more uh, uh, spiteful and disobedient to God. And as a result, the nations found themselves in ruin. And so chapter 16, we began to see that the place, that the, 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 the shift becomes almost permanent because people have gone so far from God, they can't remember what it was like to really love and trust God. So now comes chapter 17, and I want you to be clear, when things are going bad, God will always have the last say. Uh, I want you to understand, no matter what goes on in the White House, no matter what goes on in the world, they don't have the last say. I want to say this right here, Congress doesn't have the last say. God has the final word. For while the kings may have thought they had control, they had control only as far as God allowed their control to last. Chapter 17, look at verse 1. The Bible says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, I part I like about this is Elijah did not have a resume prior to chapter 17. Prior to chapter 17, nobody had heard really of Elijah. Elijah was not someone who was working his way up the ladder corporately or politically. Elijah was just somebody that God called to give a word unto the people as a result of what God wanted them to know. Now, I want you to understand that sometimes you may feel like you're insignificant, but ain't nobody insignificant to God. Tell your neighbor, there ain't nobody insignificant to God. You may, you may feel like nobody knows you. Nobody may know you, but I want you to understand, if you're a child of God, guess who knows you? God knows you. And I want somebody to understand, if God knows you, it don't matter who else knows you. If you are a child of God, it doesn't matter who else can call your name. God called Elijah and brought him out of, out of, out of the Argelian and said, Here, go tell Ahab, give him a message directly from me. See that, in other words, God, God said, I want to send an email, I want to send him a text message, I want, to, I want to shoot him a Twitter, I want you to do it, my life. I want you to take this word from me and take it to Ahab. He said, Ahab, look here, as the Lord God of Israel lives, just as surely as I'm standing in your face, it shall not be any rain, unless God gives me the word to let you know it's on the way. He stood before Ahab. I want y'all to kind of picture that right now. Here's a man with no portfolio, no real significant background. Somehow or another, he has an audience with the king. And you can imagine it must have been a, 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 a mighty daunting experience to stand before the king. And not only stand before the king, but give the king some stuff he didn't really want to hear. He stood before the king and told the king, it's not going to rain. And you don't worry about it. Don't, eat, don't, eat, don't, don't get your raincoat. Don't do nothing. It's not going to rain. And when it is going to rain, I'm going to be the one to let you know that the rain is on the way. He said, I'm going to be the meteorologist to let you know that it's about to rain. So you can go on because it's not going to rain, Ahab. And I want you to know it's your fault. That's what I want to get to. Verse 2, verse 2, verse 2. And the word of the Lord came to, came to him and said, Go and go eastward and go and hide thyself by the brook Shereth. And this is what I want to talk about. Here's what happened. He made this declaration to the king. But then God gave him a message to go east and hide himself in another place. Now, I always wondered when I read this one out the kid, why did he go to the east and hide himself? Nothing had happened. But later on, if you read the text, we understand that Ahab was not happy about the word that came to him. And God preemptively moved him from the place of a problem to a place of rest to get him ready for the rest of his work. And here's what I want somebody to understand, that, that we have to understand. The perception of a problem sometimes can cause us to be fearful. But if you know God, God will move you out of a problem before it becomes a problem in your life. Don't have anybody on Sunday right now. Sometimes you're worried about what it looks like, but God has a way of moving you. And can I tell somebody, when God moves you, you ought to go ahead and move. When God gives you some instruction, you ought to go ahead and get out of the way. Don't, don't try to handle it by yourself. Let God redirect you and put him, put you where he wants you to be. Because that's what happened. He told him to go. Now he was standing before Ahab, having this confrontation with Ahab. God said, now look here. Now you don't ask you to don't you do nothing else. Now I want you to go take you a break. He told Elijah, I want you to go take you a sabbatical. I want, I want you to go get some time to yourself. And when you're by yourself, I'm going to get you ready for what else I have for you to do. Watch this. He says, he said, go to the brook Shereth. He says, and I like this. 
God says, now go to the shrimp. But when you go, I want you to understand, I've already got provisions. I got all this stuff lined up for you. You, you thought you had a problem, but I'm going to pull you out of the problem. I'm going to put you in a place where I can get you ready for your next work. Look at it. He said, when you go to Sharif, I've got it lined up for you. It's a vacation. You might have thought it was a problem, but I'm turning it into a vacation. You might have thought you had a challenge. But I'm turning it to a, a sabbatical. You may have thought that you were down, but I'm going to lift you up. You may have thought you were going to be without, but I'm going to give you everything you need. God says, I have an all-inclusive vacation lined up for you on the banks of the brook of Sharif. Can y'all preach this with me right here? Some of y'all been on an all-inclusive vacation. That means you don't have to pay for nothing. You don't have to sign for nothing. You ain't got to swipe your card for nothing. It's already covered because your bill was already paid. Well, for Elijah was on a trip that he didn't have to pay the bill on. God had already paid the bill. He was by himself. He was alone. God just sent him with his crew, his folk, or his people. God said, Go, you just go. I got you everything covered. You just go by yourself. Now, I can imagine in my spiritual mind that Elijah could have possibly felt alone and isolated. And he must have wondered, why did I go mess with the king in order that I had to be out here by myself? But what I want us to understand, I've said this before. There are times in our life that we need to be off by ourselves. Some of us are so consumed with having somebody to talk to that we don't take time to hear the one somebody who really got something to say. Somebody's gonna get mad right here. Some of us want to talk to our best friend every day. And our best friend ain't saying nothing. But we take up all of our available time with that person. And God, who really can direct us where we need to go, we don't have time for God. Let me go a little bit deeper, Pastor, for a second. Too many times we're worried about somebody else. We're, we're Facebooking and we're, we're, we're tweeting and we're Instagramming. And God is trying to tell us something. But we're too busy to hear from the Lord. Being by yourself is not a problem if you're by yourself connected to God. Oh, Elijah was by himself. But while he was by himself, God had assigned non-stop room service. He got breakfast and he got dinner. But I believe that, he, that he, when he ate breakfast, it was so much breakfast that it lasted him all the way through lunch. It wasn't that God left out lunch, it was just he was so full from the buffet breakfast that God had provided that it wasn't until later on that he got hungry anyway. When you are alone with God, here's what can happen. You can see the provision of God. Can I tell somebody this right here? Now God is providing for us every day. Tell, tell your neighbor that God is doing it every day. Say, say he is doing it. Every day. He, he's not taking that. I know this about God. God don't take no time off. The Bible says he neither slumbers nor sleeps. So everything we get, we get because God made it available to us. But the problem is sometimes in life, we're so busy going and coming. We don't realize what God is doing. We're talking, I heard people say this all the time. I'm just on the grind. I'm just on the grind. Can I tell somebody, your grind ain't nothing but God allowing you to be able to do what it is he put before you. It ain't your grind. You wouldn't have nothing to grind on if God didn't make it available to you to do it. When you are by yourself, it is clear that God's provision is enough. And I believe that sometimes God got to put us by ourselves so we can see what he has been doing for us. How about this? It ain't until you really sick that you realize that God is a healer. 
it ain't till you broke that you realize God will give you all that you need. It ain't till you got your back against the wall that you realize God will make a way out of no way. It is sometimes God got to line us up alone to let us watch what he is doing. Got the perception of a problem, but it ain't a really no problem because God is showing you His provision out of what you think to be your problem. Can I tell somebody from here? Somebody right now lost their job or about to lose their job. Do not worry. It is simply a perception of a problem because out of this, God is going to show you His provision. I want somebody to grab hold of that. Somebody here is going through something and it looks bad. But because you are a child of God, don't look at it from the, uh, the physical eye. Look at it from your spiritual eye. Understand it looks worse than it is, but most of all, out of what it is, God can make it what it's going to be. I had to get a little, I had to get a little real that moment. I don't know what happened. He got, he got, he got, he's got his food delivered. He got his water. Then he could get free refills on. And then it came a time. The Bible says, verse 7, that the brook that provided the water dried up. It stopped running. You think he was pressing it. Look bad, didn't it? Yes, yes. I think, you know, he, he was on the run. Yes. Everything was good. Now situation changed. Yes. Elijah might ask, what am I supposed to do now? But before he could really ask the question, verse 8 tells us that God was already on the move. Can I tell somebody something? You may think, you, you may be trying to figure out what you're going through, but God already knows where you are. He knows where you've been, and God still knows where, where you're going. And so while you're busy trying to figure it out, God has already, he's already worked it out. I wish I had somebody had been through something and know that you didn't get through it because you were so good, but you got through it because God is so great. Before he could say a word, God said, now. I want you to leave where you are. I know I sent you here, but this particular segment of your vacation is over. Now I got some work for you to do, but even in this work, I want you to understand it's my assignment. And we talked about this yesterday in the minister's leadership. All of us who are saved are on divine assignments. Can you help your neighbor this last time? Tell your neighbor you're on divine assignment. That, that you're not just doing you think you do you think you're in your position because you you earned it no you on divine assignment you think you're where you are because you got there by your hard work you on divine assignment even if you ain't where you want to be right now you still on divine the word came to him it said get up go to Zarephath which is in the state of Zidon and stay there. But as you stay there, understand this. I have assigned you a concierge who's going to take care of you while you are in Zarephath in the state of Zidon. I, oh Lord, have mercy. We finna go, we finna go down to Zarephath. Can we all go with me for a moment? We're going down to Zarephath. Go down and I want you to stand. Don't worry about nothing. The same way I took care of you in the brook, I'm going to take care of you in Zarephath. I want you to understand when you're following God on a divine assignment, understand God can send you where he wants to send you and you just got to trust God to do the rest. I'm tell you, they will trust him to do the rest. Trust him. I believe this. Elijah wouldn't have been ready for Zarephath if he hadn't had to deal with the brook in the first place. So sometimes God takes you through something to get you ready for something else. I wish I had some folk who could understand that you think your life is just happening day by day, but God has already lined up your life. You just got to walk it out. Now, to fully understand this whole Zarephath situation, Zarephath wasn't just a city in Zidon. 
It was the hometown of Jezebel, Ahab's wife. Ahab himself wasn't much enough. But his wife was worse than he was. And what made it worse than that was Ahab was henpecked. Which meant that Jezebel told him what to do all the time about everything. Jezebel was really somebody you didn't really want to be bothered with. Now God chose to send his child, his servant Elijah, to the hometown of Jezebel. Now some of us, if we had looked on our itinerary, and we had seen a Zarephath coming our way, we would have said, no Lord, I'll turn that trip back. I don't care if it's all expensive pay. Lord, I don't want to go to Zarephath. No way, no how can I reschedule this for another time at another place. But God, when you are on divine assignment, there will, I'm going to speak about this one, be times that God will put you in a place and dealing with some people you really don't want to be bothered with. There will be some folk that you would rather have to do anything but to deal with them. There will be some places that God will send you that you really don't want to have to go. But because you're on divine assignment, do not turn down the assignment that God has for you. Because if you mess up this assignment, it may be a while before you get your next assignment. Yeah, I know this all right here. Yeah, I know that's some stuff I had to deal with. I didn't really, I would have done anything. I would have, you could have done anything to me to have to deal with what I had to do. But I was on a blind assignment. I had to go through there to get to where God was taking me. The Bible says in verse 10, that after receiving his travel plans from God, he got up verse 10. Don't take my word. And he went to Zarephath. Despite what I'm sure was trepidation in his heart, he decided, I'm going to go because God sent me. Look at the Bible. It doesn't seem like there was any waste of time. God says, get up. Next verse, the Bible says, he got up. That's the thing I want to sort of say. Some of us, God says, get up. And we figure out a way to sit down a little while longer. If anybody ever had kids in here, you know it. You son, get up and go do that right now. It looks like they come up with everything in the world than to do what you have assigned them to do. And the reality is many of us are big kids in relation to who God is. God said, do this. And we said, wait a minute, Lord, I got to do this right here. Oh, it got quiet. So I'll, I'll turn the volume down on the folk out there. God said, I got this for you to do. Do it. Well, Lord, I would. I, look, Lord, really. I would go to Bible study. It's in the good heaven. I would go to Bible study. But I, I work late. I don't get up at 6 o'clock. And if I, if I drive all the way, I still ain't going to get there at 7. We don't start at 7. But we make excuses. Because we're not ready to get up and go where God wants us to go. Lord, say, I, I want you to, I want you to usher, I want you to sing in the choir, I want you to do evangelism, I want you to do missions, I want you to work in the kitchen, I want you to do all these things. I would, Lord, but I'm working on something else right now. God. I hear, no, I hear you, God, but I got something else. Elijah got up and he went to Zarephath. I better move on for now because I'll be, I'll be gonna walk down in a minute. He went to Zarephath, and when he came into the city gates, the Bible says that he didn't have to even get into the city before he saw the person that God had assigned to take care of him. Now, right off the bat, he saw this nice. He saw this wood. If you don't read no more, it looks good. God, God did exactly what he said. But God didn't do it in the way he probably expected God to do it. Because if you read past what it says, it says, He rose, went to Zarephath, but he came to the gate of the city. Behold, the widow woman was there. She was gathering sticks. 
Now, right, that, that, that's where it starts. But then, when you read a little further, you recognize that this widow woman wasn't some lady who uh, was the widow of a rich man. She, she wouldn't have been married to. She wasn't Jackie O. She wasn't somebody who had a whole lot. She really didn't have nothing. Look what the Bible says. She was gathering sticks. He said to her, thinking, hey, she got a cup of, give me some water and a vessel that I may drink it. And she went and went and got the water. And then she said, bring me a sandwich. Bring me a morsel of bread. And, 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 and she said, well, now, I'll be honest with you. I, that, I can get you some water. But this whole bread thing, I can't help you. Not only do I have not had no bread for you, I don't have no bread for me and my little boy. I, I, all I got is a, a little meat, a little meal, and a little oil. And, and, and if you see me working here getting these sticks, the only reason I'm getting these sticks is because I'm trying to make one last meal to eat before we die. You see Elijah now. I said, wait a minute, Lord. You said, wait a minute. Now, in Sharath, you had me eating twice a day. And have plenty to drink. Now you done sent me down here to Jezebel's hometown with this lady who ain't got nothing. And you said she was gonna be able to take care of me. Lord, what, tell me what you're doing, Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure this thing out. I, I'm here in Zarephath. I, it's a hard place to be, but I'm here. And now you sent this lady who ain't got nothing to take care of me. How's she gonna take care of me? If she take care of herself. Let me pause again. Sometimes we get pressed. But can I tell you, in that pressing thing, you got to recognize one thing. Ain't nobody like God. Tell you, neighbor, tell you, neighbor, ain't nobody like God. Let me go a little further. Nobody knows the mind of God. Nobody knows the ways of God. Nobody knows how God going to do. How God going to do what he going to do. And because we are on divine assignment, it is not for us to question what God is doing. It's instead incumbent upon us to do whatever it is that God says to do. Too many times we're talking and debating with God. It's time out to debate God. Instead, it's time in to do exactly what God says. Now, I'm just going to talk to St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church just for a moment. Just, just hold on one second. We have allowed everything and everybody else to define who we are. We are who God says that we are. And it doesn't matter how it looks in the parking lot or what kind of cars out there, what kind of clothes, everything that we need, God has already provided. Don't look at your church and say, we ain't got nobody to do this. We don't need, well, we need who we need. We need who God sent. And who God sent got everything God wants us to have. All right, now I'm back to everybody else. Elijah, because he was on divine assignment. Can I tell somebody, when you're on divine assignment, God is going to give you some divine insight. See, this is why I tell people all the time, the importance of the Bible study is not just we want you to be up there, you know, clapping your hands. We like, you know, I'm sure all the teachers, which I'll agree, we like folks clap their hands when we teach it. But that ain't why we teach the word. We teach the word so that we will have some divine insight and inspiration directly from God. See, if you don't know what God is saying, you can't possibly know what to do in a certain situation. But if you know what God is saying, you'll be equipped to deal with whatever comes your way. In other words, there's nothing that life problems that life has that does not have a divine solution. And there's no solution that God has not included in this book right here. Everything that you have faced has a out here in the word of God. When you are, see, if you're on divine assignment and you ain't got no word in you, you're just walking around. But when you're on divine assignment and you're full of word, you're ready for whatever happens in your... I wish I had somebody saw that right there. How many times have you been going through a trouble and the word from the Lord spoke to your life and spoke to your situation? How many of us, when we were about to give up, it was a word from the Lord that caused us to stand up straight and say, I'm just going to stand and trust God. How many of us in the midnight hour when we couldn't reach nobody else on the phone, was it a word from the Lord that caused us to be able to go back to sleep? Elijah, I'm about finishing now. Elijah told this lady, look here, don't be afraid. I want you to go and do exactly what I asked you to do. I told you to go get me a piece of bread 
and bring it to me. And she, he said, I want you to go ahead and do it. I want you to do what you said you were about to do. Get this meal you got and get this oil that you have. Take them sticks and go ahead and do what you were going to do. But before you eat it yourself, I want you to bring me a little cake first. And, 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 and don't, don't think about it, lady, because, because if you start thinking about it, you're going to talk yourself out of it. Just do it, because I'm here on divine assignment from the Lord. And what I want you to know is that even though it may look like you don't have enough, God has a way of making a little something more than enough. Do I have any witnesses in here? How many of us can look back over our lives and realize that God took a little something, something, and made more than enough out of it? Some of us are where we are today because God special lives in multiplication that can't no mathematician understand. When I was in college, I took a class. I took it only one week. I had to drop the class because I couldn't figure it out. But it's called finite math. And finite math had numbers. You know, in regular math, you got two plus two equals four. And you get a little further along algebra, you might put a couple of parentheses around there and add it up. But finite math had numbers flying all over everywhere. And it was so many numbers that I just could not understand it. And after one week, two classes, I said, look here, y'all can have that class. I'm going to change my major to something else, but I can't handle that. There's more than I can conceptualize in my mind. Can I talk to somebody for a minute? Sometimes, and when I realized, and the teacher said this before, as I was even signing my drop ass, he said, the problem is you're thinking about it too much. He said, if you just listen to what I'm saying, you let the numbers confuse you. You let the numbers scare you. Just work the problem out and you recognize that no matter where the number is, it can always be assessed and addressed appropriately according to the equation. Some of us let problems defy and, and confuse and frustrate and cause us to give up. But I want you to understand, stop looking at what you see around you. Stop trying to figure the problem out and work the problem out according to the rules that God has given you in his word. Put it like this. When you're standing there thinking you don't have nothing, you're looking at your bills. And you realize it's more money than money. If you just go ahead back to the book and say, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. And then look back at that bill and recognize that the God you serve is able to take your money and stretch it out over a month long. That's the kind of God we serve. But you got to know the word in order to experience his power in your life. Bible says he said, go on and do it. He says, furthermore, young lady, I want you to know that as you do what the Lord has given me to tell you to do, as you follow the word of the Lord, I want you to know that God told me to tell you that the meal that you got, it ain't gonna never run out. And the oil that you have, you ain't gonna never get to the bottom of that barrel. You gonna have enough. Matter of fact, he said you gonna have more than enough to last you throughout this situation. You're going to have more than enough to eat every day in the midst of the drought. Now let me let me backspace this and tell you this right here. Sometimes we look at a national situation and we begin to worry about what's going to happen to us. But I want to tell some children of God, when you are a child of God, no matter what it looks like in the newspaper, you are still under the authority and in the economy that God has provided for you. In other words, everybody else may be going broke, but God can, can, he can prosper you in the midst of what you're going through because you belong to him. You just in the world. You're not of the world. <laughs> Bible says she went on ahead and some have argued that she, she had faith. Some have argued that she had understanding of knowledge about God. I can't argue that. But what I do know is Elijah told her what God said to do. And she did. In other words, sometimes it's not about theology. 
it, it, it's just about can you hear and do what God says to do. Sometimes it's not about a deep philosophical class or the origin of theology or philosophy. It's not about theory. It's about practicality. Can you read the word and can you do what God said to do? Verse 15 says, we through here. Now the Bible says she went and she did what Elijah said to do. And the Bible says during that time they did eat. They after day, y'all go with me. After day, after day, after another day, and in my spiritual life, I can imagine Friday came up and not only did they have some bread, but they also had a little piece of fish, and, and maybe Saturday came and they had some bread, and maybe they had a piece of steak, and maybe Sunday came and they had some bread, and maybe a little bit of chicken, fried preferably, maybe Sunday came and they might have had a little collard greens and macaroni and cheese, but I want you to know that God gave her everything, more than the drought lasted, God gave her everything she needed. I stop by St. Peter to tell somebody today, you may look like you have a problem, but know that God can provide in the midst of your problem. Understand, you may be pressed on every side, but understand that out of your pressing, God can give you a plenty. And, and when you just walk with the Lord, when you just trust in the Lord, when you just hold to God's unchanging hand, God will. He'll make a way for you. When you trust the Lord, He will pick you up. He'll turn you around. He'll put your feet on solid ground. Won't He do it? Do I have anybody here know He'll do it? Won't He do it? Won't He do it? Won't He give you joy in the midst of your sorrow? Won't He give you peace in the midst of your frustration? Won't He give you everything? Another day, another day, God, 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 God
Oh! 